Good morning. Uh, my name is Ahmad Harab. I'm the uh, Director of Research at the Arab Center, Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome for, uh, to our first panel uh, titled Addressing the Root Causes of Conflict in the Arab World. Um, uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, this morning. Uh, I think uh, our panel would uh, uh, basically uh, put the, uh, uh, the day going, uh, talking about the root causes of uh, the, Arab, of the uh, conflict in the Arab world. Um, uh, for those of us who have uh, joined us just now, uh, there are uh, some uh, Q&A questions at, uh, in front of you at the, uh, the desk. Please uh, fill those out when you, uh, if you have a question, and uh, one of the staff will pick it up from you and uh, turn it over here. Um, uh, there are, uh, please, I mean, there, there are those uh, telephones that every once in a while just simply go off without us really knowing, wanting them to go off, but they do. Uh, please silence those phones, and uh, our hashtag is uh, 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 ACWDC2018, uh, if you want to uh, tweet something. Uh, it is, um, it's really an, uh, an honor sharing the uh, uh, podium today with, uh, uh, with a distinguished set of uh, people who are going to be talking about the different aspects of uh, uh, conflict, uh, causes uh, for conflict in the Arab world. Uh, as a matter of fact, these are uh, uh, causes that are not only in the Arab world. Unfortunately, these are causes of conflict generally, and uh, the Arab world has unfortunately uh, uh, gotten a lot of these causes uh, in active conflicts uh, today. Um, uh, we are uh, going to uh, uh, do this in, uh, uh, in the following fashion. Rami Khouri will... Uh, uh, from uh, the University, American University of Beirut. He's the uh, professor of journalism and public policy and senior uh, fellow at the university. Uh, Sarah Leah Watson will, uh, be, uh, will, uh, is the executive director of uh, Middle East and North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch. Uh, Noura Riqat is assistant professor at George, Wash uh, George Mason University. And Meron Kimbrava, who is the professor and uh, director of Center for International and Regional Studies at George, Georgetown University, uh, Doha, Qatar. Uh, many thanks to uh, all of you uh, for uh, joining us, and uh, we will start with that uh, with that order. Rami, please go right ahead. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you to the Arab Center for uh, organizing this, and thank you all for uh, coming out. Um, we have about 13 minutes or something each? Uh, uh, yes, 12, yeah, 12, 12 to 15. Okay, so give, give, give there, will be, there will be signs at the end reminding us, I think. Give me a two-minute signal when sure. the yeah, we will. We so will. in that short period of time, uh, I'll give you my quick uh, thoughts on what it, are the underlying drivers and causes of conflict in the Arab world. This is a book project I'm working on, and uh, I've been looking into these issues for, for some years. I mean, the big picture, of course, is that we are um, at the end of a rather tumultuous century that started in 1917-18 uh, with a, a, a very vicious act by the greatest colonial power of the time then, which was Great Britain, by a man called Arthur James Balfour, who decided to uh, give the land of Palestine to other people. Uh, and we end this century with an equally vicious man from the greatest power in the world, the United States now, which is Jared Kushner, who basically is saying, <laughs> who basically is saying, unlike Balfour, who said the Palestinians don't own this land, Kushner is saying, well, the Palestinians don't exist. They have no rights, they have no voice, they have no uh, existence, and they should just be bludgeoned out of, uh, out of life. But we have to look at this century to understand What's happened? We had 60 years of really significant national development across the Arab world, sustained state building, the rise of a big middle class, um, uh, huge progress in women's education, homes, jobs, etc. There was a the, the, the story of Arab development from 1920 to 1980 was is really a magnificent one that's never been uh, told. But after 1980, the last 40 years or so, we've had a period of stagnation and then uh, regression in recent years. And th th there's many reasons for this, which I don't have time uh, to get into, but essentially the Arab political e economy model, the rentier system, 
that, uh, that produced such significant growth and a lot of uh, um, e equality and uh, human development for the first six years of this century, uh, that political model collapsed with the end of the Cold War. The continuation of the Arab-Israeli conflict for a century now, which I, I say is probably one of the biggest underlying drivers, the ramifications of that, one of which is the advent of the Arab police states and security states, military officers taking power in the 40s and 50s, and transforming the Arab world starting in the 1980s from developmental nationalist states to security-run consumer states. Citizens became consumers, governments became family-run security organizations, uh, and later, uh, independent countries uh, became actually uh, commission agents for foreign powers to deal with uh, security and terrorism. And all of these things uh, happened t uh, together. And if we look at, again, the broad picture, uh, we have, I would say, five main broad drivers, which my colleagues here will talk about in different details. One is domestic autocracy and incompetence starting in the 1980s. Uh, two, um, and, and linked to that, of course, the continued high population growth versus low economic growth, and therefore uh, per capita income started to decline, and we started to get poverty and other issues which I'll mention. Second is the end of the Cold War and the reconfiguration that brought about. Third one is the continued Arab-Israeli conflict after a century. The fourth one is nonstop foreign military intervention not just for the past century, but really since the past two and a quarter century since Napoleon, almost nonstop foreign military intervention, which has accelerated in the last decade faster than any other rate in previous times, uh, uh, highlighted by what we see in Syria today. And this has been now uh, accentuated by rising regional military intervention, Turkey, Israel, Iran, Hezbollah, Saudi Arabia, UAE, other Arab countries, militarily getting directly involved inside Arab countries effectively bringing us to the phase of the de-sovereignization of Arab states. Uh, Arab states have essentially, broadly speaking, with some exceptions, Arab states have essentially failed the twin tests of sovereignty and citizenship and statehood. Three tests, but sovereignty is statehood. Uh, and the one sign of this is the extraordinary intervention of uh, Arab, Israeli, Iranian, Turk, and, and foreign countries inside uh, other Arab countries, and the fifth broad reason is the um, environmental deterioration, which is linked to the incompetence and mismanagement of Arab governments. So this has led to a situation now, so the real driver now in the Arab world, which I'm working on in this book that I mentioned, is, is really the fragmentation of once what had been once an integrated Arab region and that had once been, for the most part, integrated, coherent, stable, and developmentally impressive individual Arab countries, that has shattered. What we're experiencing now is the second great fragmentation of the Arab world. The first one was 1920, which created the modern Arab state system. So the fragmentation and reconfiguration of 1920, a century later, is now uh, followed by a second great fragmentation as individual countries start to fragment and, and polarize and shatter in some cases, uh, and the whole region has lost its integrity as, uh, as a single Arab, uh, Arab unit. And the consequence is poverty, vulnerability, and massive inequalities. Poverty, vulnerability, and inequality leading to this polarization uh, which is happening in social, political, economic, uh, and other fields. Almost every field of life now which is measured well, which wasn't measured well before, but is now measured well with surveys, polling evidence, uh, serious studies by people like uh, ESQA, the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, the UN, uh, the great UN agency that does extraordinary studies, and other people, UNICEF is working on this, uh, international groups, scholars, we now have an incredible amount of evidence. And it all shows that in virtually every sector of life, gender, age, um, regional, urban, rural, ethnicity, uh, income, uh, education level, in every dimension of life, we are experiencing more polarization within the majority of Arab countries. A few of the wealthy oil-producing countries don't experience this. That's about 10% of the Arab world, which lives in its own world because of their small populations and large amount of money, but they're starting to experience some of these same pressures as well. We have a very important new instrument 
that is being developed that explains some of this material, which is the Arab multidimensional poverty studies that have been done by, by ASQA and the Oxford Development Center and other people are looking at the situation by using more accurate measures. Historically, and even at the beginning of the Arab uprisings, the World Bank and Arab countries and governments were all saying, oh, we're growing 6%, and, and uh, this is uh, the macroeconomic development st statistics are really good. The reality is when you, and poverty is declining. So m m poverty measures that Arab governments give you will tell you, well, we have 4%, maybe 7% poverty. The reality is measured more accurately now by the multidimensional poverty analysis, which looks at all dimensions of life and also looks at the, takes in the 1% wealthy people in the Arab world, the 10% uh, one wealthy people in the Arab world who traditionally are left out of these kind of surveys. Um, but when you take the whole Arab population and you study it at all indicators of the capabilities and opportunities that are available to people in their daily life, you get a much, much more accurate figure. And the, figure, the, 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 the results are quite shocking. They show that 66%, two thirds, of the Arab population is either in poverty or uh, what is called vulnerability. And I think the vulnerability measure is the more important one. Vulnerability means you're either right on the edge of poverty or you're lower middle income and you're extremely vulnerable if your one breadwinner in the family loses his or her job, if your truck that you use to make money by selling vegetables, if your truck breaks down, your income stops, you immediately plunge into poverty because there's no social safety net you probably don't have insurance, there's probably not a government program to assist you, and therefore the vulnerability dimension of the Arab world uh, is right now, I think, the most important. And about 25% of Arab people, broadly speaking, who have been surveyed in especially the middle income countries, about 25% are, uh, are vulnerable. And this is increasing because uh, jobs and incomes are stagnating, uh, poverty is increasing, vulnerability is, is, is increasing, the middle class is shrinking, the recent surveys show that the middle class used to be around 45% as uh, the UN measured it. It's now around 33% and it's still uh, going down. And therefore the big picture, and here is what I consider the single most important cause of conflict or driver of conflict. Um, um, you won't see this if you go to Abu Dhabi, you won't see it if you go to West Amman, you won't see it if you go to Zamalek in Cairo, but you'll see it if you go out and look at all of the societies in our region. Uh, the single biggest factor is that we don't have an Arab world anymore. We just have an Arab region whose 400 million people have split uh, into four different groups. There's about 10% who are wealthy professionals and others who made their money legitimately and industrialists, uh, and, and then others who made their money because of their uh, rentier uh, crony capitalist links to the great power and the great leader and corruption. About 10% of the Arab region's population is, is wealthy and well off. About 30%, I would say, is middle class. Uh, about 55% are poor and vulnerable, and that is the segment that's growing fastest. And there's another 5% of the Arab world that has actually left the Arab world. These are people who've joined ISIS and Qaeda and militant groups. They've immigrated to Europe, they've joined tribal militias, they've, they've left the public sphere, political institutions and social and economic institutions of the Arab world because their states totally failed them, did not give them what they expected from their states in terms of citizenship, and they've gone, they're in the Arab world, but they're not of the Arab world. They have, they have linked their personal condition, their identity, their political opportunities, their security, their representation, their voice, their protection, their social services, they've linked these to non-state institutions, some of them foreign, some of them local, some religious, some tribal, some ideological. Uh, so we have these four different groups uh, in the Arab world, and the real dilemma is that the poverty and vulnerability are deep, wide, chronic, and worsening in most cases. And they're worsening because all of the factors that should drive the economy are in uh, a negative situation. Tourism income, direct foreign investment, uh, labor remittances, uh, compensatory financing by governments, uh, private sector investments, most of the major drivers of economic growth are not working. They're not driving uh, economic growth. And therefore, uh, what's worse is not only are these uh, indicators almost in all cases uh, worsening, and therefore poverty and vulnerability and disparity are going to increase in the 
short run. What's equally troubling is that these have become chronic. In other words, and one of the aspects of the multidimensional poverty studies that have been done, one of the in incredibly interesting dimensions of this is that uh, two factors are uh, heavily responsible for explaining why families are poor and why they stay poor. One is the low education level of the parents or the children. Um, and we, uh, we see in, in other testing, service, testing uh, services that are done of students across the region, around 45 to 50 percent of mid-secondary and mid-primary students in Arab countries don't know how to read and write and do arithmetic. In other words, almost half of the people in primary and secondary schools are not learning anything. They're going to drop out or graduate without knowing anything, and therefore we have about 60% informal labor rates in most of our countries. And in some places it goes up to 70 or 80, but around 60% seems to be the average, and this is also increasing. Six, informal labor is vulnerable poor people in most cases. Um, and so education is one reason when a family becomes poor and vulnerable, education is one explanation. The other one is poor services of early childhood development and well-being. Between birth and the age of five, very few children in the Arab world are getting the kind of early childhood development that they deserve and need to become full human beings. Those two things together, including the third one, which is less but as important as housing conditions, those three things mean that once you're poor in the Arab world, you're poor for several generations to come. It's almost impossible to pull a family out of poverty in the existing conditions we have in the Arab world, where continued structural adjustment means that government debt is rising. Most governments who are doing structural adjustment don't have extra money to create new jobs. They're cutting back government jobs. Uh, social safety nets are barely hanging in there uh, where they exist. And therefore, we expect to see more um, uh, 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 deterioration in the conditions of poverty, disparity, and vulnerability, which create desperate people. Some of them try to swim to Europe and they die on the beaches with their kids. Some of them try to migrate illegally. Some of them go and join uh, a militant group that will pay them $100 a month and that keeps the family alive. That's all they need, $100, $150 a month. Um, and this is worsening now because the latest figures that have been compiled by various UN agencies show that about 30 million displaced people, either refugees or internally displaced, there's 30 million displaced people in the Arab countries and uh, there are 60 million people, approximately, of the 400 million Arabs, 60 million who need aid just to survive. Water, health, food, um, fuel, oil, whatever. So we're dealing with a rather catastrophic situation, uh, which is almost totally unreported in the Arab press and the international press. Um, what we have is a situation in the Arab world where the mainstream of the Arab population um, is poor and vulnerable and is getting worse. They have no political voice. There's no re redress of grievance. Uh, there's no serious mechanism by which they can raise these issues and fix their own predicament. Uh, and they're like African Americans in the 1940s. They're invisible people. They don't exist. You don't read about them in the media because in the mainstream media, Arab and international, these are invisible people. They don't matter. They don't have power, they don't have agency, nobody cares about them, and therefore, Jared Kushner could come along and say, well, these Palestinians, then the hell with them, take away their, uh, the money we help them just to get education and health care." And this is the kind of pressure that is increasing across the Arab world, leading to desperation among individuals who then um, take decisions to s help their families just survive. These are biological decisions, not ideological decisions. Somebody who joins ISIS or Qaeda or one of the militant groups or tries to uh, join a criminal gang or, or does smuggling, these are, I these, are ideolog these are biological decisions, not ideological ones. So this, these are, I think, the main issues that uh, drive the conflicts in our region, and they're going to get worse, so we better look at them more carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. I appreciate it. Uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you uh, to the Arab Center for uh, this invitation and especially the hopeful title of the uh, conference today, which is the Arab World Beyond Conflict. Um, that, that seems quite a bit off uh, from our current day. 
Um, I've been asked to address three internal aspects of the conflicts in the Middle East, uh, specifically marginalization, human rights, and civil society. And I don't think it will surprise anyone in this audience with the basic assertion that the marginalization, systemic human rights abuses, and disempowerment or de-development of civil society are central features of the conflicts in our region. The challenge for human rights activists or academic or journalists seeking to reform governments is that the governments firmly believe their population must remain marginalized with no meaningful voice in their government and no accountability for their powers, economic, political, or security that govern them. These governments don't want to be reformed. The human rights abuses they carry out, typically torture, arbitrary arrests, at times killings, curtailment of any free expression of their citizenry in writing or in protest are part and parcel of their system of control over their population. The disempowerment of civil society, refusing to allow civil society organizations to operate independently of the government, are also a product of deliberate design. For states that exercise absolute authority, as many of the uh, Arab governments do, a citizenry that has a voice in the levers of government and the economy can demand respect for its human rights and is able to assemble collectively is by its very nature an existential threat. With the most authoritarian governments whose survival depends on suppression of its citizenry, at best we can chip away at the margins of their abuses in areas like the worst systemic torture here, a loosening of press, uh, press restrictions there, release of political detainees maybe, as they throw a few crumbs to appease the liberalization demands of some of the softer Western states. But the fact remains, for undemocratic governments that are not tested at the ballot box, when there's a bit more freedom, space, and engagement, the first thing civil society wishes to do is to get rid of them. And that's typically because authoritarianism goes hand in hand with corruption, abuse, and inefficiency. I say this because any government that has no accountability and whose primary purpose is to block any challenges to its rule, no matter how faint, is going by nature to be corrupt, abusive, and ineffective. And that's certainly the pattern we've seen in the Middle East where sadly such governments are a dime a dozen. So in reality, you can think about the deliberate intentional policies of marginalization, human rights abuses, and the kneecapping of civil society as conflict avoidance strategies. They typically work for a long time until there's an eruption of the sort we saw in the 2011 uprisings or Iraq's war with ISIS. Egypt is a perfect case in point. The Egyptian revolution unfolded at a time when Mubarak had eased up on his absolute control over the population. Yes, the good old days of Mubarak, whom we now remember George Bush-like as a softer, gentler leadership era given what we face today. Well before the uprisings in 2005, the Mubarak government, under pressure from Bush and Rice to democratize, allowed the Muslim Brotherhood, long its semi-tolerated opposition, to compete more broadly in elections, winning 88 seats in parliament, although not without eight deaths in those elections. It reflected the government's desire to show what political pluralism will look like. You want democracy? By 2011, the Egyptian press was certainly freer than it had been in for the prior decades and Egyptian civil society organizations, primarily Muslim Brotherhood groups providing social services, but also human rights organizations, humanitarian organizations, were strong and active, if tightly overseen by the government with narrow space to function. What remained endemic, however, was torture and abuse by security forces, as violence is the ultimate form of societal control and clearly quite addictive to security forces that operate with impunity. 
When the Egyptian uprising erupted in January 2011, it was on the anniversary of the death of Khalid Said, a young Egyptian man who had been tortured to death by security forces in Alexandria. The initial protests were overwhelmingly about accountability for security force abuses, as well as ending military trials of civilians. The electoral success of the Muslim Brotherhood following the revolution in both parliament and the presidency reflected its strength in civil society throughout the country and its popularity among a wide segment of the population. It's open for speculation whether more secular or nationalist candidates or parties would have been more successful had they had the same space to organize and reach the public. Many explain away the weak showing of secular and leftist parties as a product of their forced disorganization. But I'm not sure, and that remains speculation. And so post-counter-revolution, it's no accident that the coup government's first act was to jail all of the viable opposition. 40 to 50,000 Muslim brothers, killing over 1,000 protesters at Rabah Square five years ago last month, in case folks didn't get the memo that the coup was real and not going back, and hundreds more who turned up in protests in the year or two after that. But the Sisi government learned its lesson from what it now saw as the naive and weak Mubarak, and has moved to ensure that there will not be an iota of space for an uprising or any form of accountability to ever happen again. It's not been satisfied with a campaign of terror against the Brotherhood and all of its supporters, including declaring them a terrorist organization, shutting down all of their civil society organizations, confiscating all of their assets, private and organizational, from schools, hospitals, and so on. It's since turned to all other political opposition, including ones who pose no actual political or competitive threat, like members of the secular and leftist parties, or even old regime loyalists like Ahmed Shafiq, now under effective house arrest, and most recently, Mubarak's sons. One of Sisi's first acts was to pass a draconian public assembly law, effectively making it illegal to protest anywhere, and then passed a new NGO law that is yet to be implemented that ends the notion of any independent civil society organization in the country. And then not satisfied with that curtailment, Sisi has moved to arrest or travel ban the country's human rights activists and journalists, and now even scraping the bottle of the barrel of what might be opposition to the state, photographers, actors, dancers, musicians, singers, and artists. There is no free press in Egypt anymore. There is mass surveillance of private communications, thanks to technology sold by Western companies. In recent weeks alone, Egypt adopted a law that empowers the state's top media regulatory agency to use the fake news label to shut down social media accounts with more than 5,000 followers without having to obtain any kind of court order. Another new law allows blocking websites with content deemed a threat to national security. Human Rights Watch's website has been blocked in Egypt. Military trials have resumed in extremely wide numbers. The one concrete gain from the revolution was the end to military trials of civilians, but the Sisi government moved to restore that and has now tried more civilians since it has come to power than over 30 years of Mubarak's reign. Our most recent report on Egypt showed wide-scale systemic torture in Egypt's prisons. The population is quiet for now, save for the quiet little war in Sinai, where five years on, the government has not been able to defeat allegedly no more than a few thousand militants. But what can only hope, if not predict, that the situation is not tenable. That's because at times, state repression and marginalization can have disastrous outcomes, creating a backlash of horrific proportions. This is what happened in Iraq in entirely predictable ways. The rise of ISIS started in Syria, of course, but its fantastic takeover of such a large swath of Iraqi territory, 
starting with the dramatic conquest of Mosul and the evaporation of Iraqi security forces, is what captured world attention. It didn't, in reality, happen overnight. It happened instead over a decade of the traumas of the Iraq War, including over half a million dead, the imprisonment and torture and natural de uh, radicalization of Iraqis at the hands of Americans, and the highly sectarian Maliki government that divided the nation into Sunni and Shia warring camps for many years to come. Human Rights Watch and others sounded the alarms about Maliki's policies against the Sunni population, including its laws of political exclusion, arbitrary mass arrests and torture, a corrupt judicial system, and indiscriminate killings and bombardment, even using barrel bombs, which the United States decried in Syria, but was silent about in Iraq, warning that it would lead to war. In 2013, well before ISIS arrived, I warned in a New York Times op-ed that the Iraqi government has hurled the country to the brink of a new civil war. By early 2014, already half a million Sunnis had been displaced by the fighting that was already underway in the Sunni provinces. The Iraqi government's conflict avoidance or conflict abatement strategies had created a vastly worse crisis. These are the conditions that galvanized support for extremist groups in Sunni areas, which coalesced into ISIS and spawned its own terror crisis. Unfortunately, the most important measures to avoid a reemergence of a new outright war, and we have already seen reports of ISIS version 2.0, are still missing in Iraq. Iraqi security forces have committed unbelievable violence against ISIS suspects and their family members. The most horrific torture and abuse, which could go neck and neck in competition with ISIS's torture and abuse, have been videotaped and proudly published on the Facebook posts of Iraqi soldiers. There have been mass prosecutions in trials lasting minutes long of over 15,000 alleged ISIS members with no regard to what crime they may have committed, resulting exclusively in life sentences or the death penalty. To say nothing of the absence of any meaningful victim participation for the victims of ISIS, including the Yazidis. Rather than meet the demands of its people halfway, the government has doubled down on its brutality, as seen most recently in the attacks on protesters in Basra, whose grievances are primarily economic. Ultimately, there's still far more hope for reform in Iraq, given its democratic structure and semblance of real political competition. But so long as states in the region continue to see power as a zero-sum game versus their own citizenry, it's difficult to envision stable and just states in this region, at least in the short term. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Sure. Thank you. Oh, on such an uplifting note, Sorry. I can't wait to continue. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, though, thank you so much for the Arab Center for Washington for assembling um, this panel, I'm already learning so much and furiously taking notes, so I'm excited to be um, in the company of these esteemed and learned advocates um, and scholars. I have been asked specifically to address the role of international law in the roots, uh, as part of the root conflict and how it entrenches it. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit to approach the question a bit theoretically to think about not the exact violations and not necessarily the outcomes of them, but instead to think about what is it in international law as a structure and an internal logic that actually creates and entrenches these conflicts rather than ends them. So, but I do have some hope. There are ways for it to be a tool of resistance as well, so I'll touch on that too. Let me start by telling you my definition. I argue that law is politics, its meaning and application is contingent on the strategy that actors deploy, as well as on the historical context, namely the balance of power and the threat and or use of coercive force in which that strategy is deployed. In order to serve an emancipatory function, international law must be wielded in a sophisticated service 
of a political movement that can both give meaning to the law as well as directly challenge the structure of power that plays certain communities and nations, including Palestinians, who I'll specifically discuss outside of the law. So to begin, just something that you should know, every law is indeterminate. We don't know what it means until it's put through an adversarial process and then through some mediated through judicial interpretation before it's applied in a particular conditions. Amongst the best law uh, examples of law's indeterminacy and of its susceptibility to this kind of legal work um, in the question of Palestine is Israel's strategic deployment of occupation law incrementally, to incrementally take Palestinian lands without the Palestinians on it. So for those who don't know, occupation law is a military legal regime meant to regulate the governance of a territory on a temporary basis until civilian authority can be restored. It's completely legal. It's supposed, it, we, we created it in order to help transition from wartime to peacetime, to revert to peacetime. The law considers an occupying power a trustee and forbids it from altering the status quo in place before the onset of occupation with the exception of what may be demanded by military necessity. In no circumstance can an occupying power acquire legal ownership or sovereignty of the territory which, be, which would be tantamount to conquest. Palestinians together with literally the consensus of the international community have affirmed the de jure application of occupation law onto the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Under their interpretation, the international consensus interpretation, Israel must maintain the territorial, legal, and demographic status quo in 1967 until the establishment of permanent peace. However, Israel has insisted that because Palestinians are not a juridical people and because no Palestinian state existed in 1967, that a sovereign void exists in the territory, meaning that the territories cannot be occupied as a matter of law. Nevertheless, Israel decreed it would apply the humanitarian provisions of the law as a matter of discretion or fact. This was not a benevolent scheme. Applying only to humanitarian provisions of occupation law but none of its national ones confers Israel with the sovereign authority in the territories while relieving it of occupation law's obligations to respect the sovereignty of the displaced power. The Palestinians, finding themselves under this unique administration, are suspended in limbo as non-citizens of Israel and as non-sovereigns under occupation completely subject to Israel's discretionary whims under the pretext of security, recognized as military necessity under occupation law, Israel could incrementally remove, dispossess, and concentrate Palestinian natives in the West Bank and Gaza while implanting Jewish nationals in their place. To overcome international consensus, rebuffing the acquisition of territory by force, Israel has used the lack of a definite article, the or all the preceding occupied territories in UN Security Council Resolution 242 to justify its steady territorial encroachment under the veneer of establishing defensible borders. Nearly every occupying power has attempted the same thing that Israel is attempting, but only the most powerful states have been successful, and in Israel's case, its success to be able to take the land without the people under a framework, a legal framework of law that it has deployed is to be, is to the US's credit, its unequivocal financial diplomatic support to Israel since 1967. Relatively weaker actors can also engage in this kind of strategic deployment of the law to achieve their political purposes, and the Palestinian Liberation Organization has been amongst the most successful actors to do so. Consider that in, during the 1970s, it, it aligned with the national, um, the non-aligned movement states to establish the rights of non-state actors to engage in guerrilla warfare. Basically, it created, it legitimated guerrilla warfare or the right to fight um, and encompassed it under an international legal regime to regulate that warfare in the additional protocols, the first and second additional protocols um, between 1944 and 1977. Um, in addition, the <coughs> 
those laws basically enabled, uh, uh, defined the Palestinian movement as a national liberation movement and reduced the stringent standards requiring combatants to distinguish themselves from civilians. They expanded those violations considered war crimes. In, con in legitimating guerrilla operations, the PLO demonstrates that legal work is not merely the purview of the strong. However, that does not obfuscate the real in the real effect of the asymmetries of power distinguishing strong and relatively weak international actors. Power remains determinative in regards to the law's enforcement and especially the ability to declare a legal exception or to suspend the law's application in order to achieve a moral or political outcome. Only the sovereign has the ability to declare an exception, which is a decision based on the assessment of what's necessary to preserve its interest. It's a moral, political conclusion outside of fact and law. It is known as a sovereign exception. You are familiar with it because it is what we implement in moments of martial law or warfare when we suspend civilian rights, for example. Some would argue that this is, outside, this is a zone of lawlessness, but in fact, uh, law contemplates it as a sui generis regime, which means that it is unlike anything like it. Because there is no precedent or analogy, you then have the right to create new laws of your own making. How does this apply in the question of Palestine? Like most cases of settler colonialism, a colonial decision based on moral and political imperatives justified the erasure and the elimination of a native population to achieve self-determination of a settler population in its place. In the case of Palestine, this was Britain's colonial decision to support the establishment of a Jewish national home in a territory where a native Arab population sought to govern itself. The Balfour Declaration constituted a legal exception that suspended Palestine as a Class A territory in the aftermath of the First World War made it distinct from all the other Class A territories in the Middle East in order to establish, to, to achieve the objective of, uh, of establishing a, a Jewish national home, which was only Britain's prerogative until 1922 when the Palestine Mandate incorporates the Balfour Declaration verbatim into its preambular text, thereby the legal exception has become part of international law and policy. Palestine has been a matter of exception since 1922. Since Israel's establishment in 1948, uh, the legal exception that denied Palestinians their status as a political community or a juridical people and allowed Israel the right to Jewish self-determination in Palestine has underscored Israel's claims of Palestinian exceptionalism. Israel has used its military and economic powers as well as its alliances to global superpowers in the past and present to advance its claim in order to create alternative legal models regulating the treatment of Palestinian life. These legal models all represent colonial continuities that perpetuate the removal, the settler colonial elimination of a native population on the ground. Any recourse for challenging this exclusion must be predicated on challenging the geopolitical structure itself, which has declared and sustained the legal exception. The PLO has done that very successfully through the 1970s, it scribed, inscribed the Palestinian people into international law and legal instruments in 1974. But upon entering the Middle East peace process in 1991, it willingly relinquished almost all of its claims enshrined in UN resolutions, as well as international treaties, including the declaration that Zionism is a form of racism and the right of Palestinians to use armed violence as part of its national liberation struggle as conditions for entering the interior of U.S. and Israeli governance. Its commitment to achieve independence through U.S. and Israeli acquiescence has neutralized its capacity to challenge the political structure that sustains an oppressive status quo, thereby diminishing the emancipatory potential of its most strident legal strategies since then. The story of the Goldstone Report, the 2004 ICJ advisory wall decision, the accession to the Rome Statute and subsequent submission to the International Criminal Court, the 2011-2012 UN statehood bid, and most recently even UN resolution, Security Council Resolution 2334, condemning settlements as a war crime, are all illuminating in this regard, and I'd be happy to discuss those with you. Suffice it to say that the Palestinian leadership's unwillingness to challenge the, the primary pillar of Israel's support in a geopolitical structure, which is the U.S. support of Israel, is what undermines these legal strategies to actually produce an outcome that recalibrates the balance of power. 
One of the most cited examples of law's beneficial impact on behalf of oppressed nations is in the case of Namibia. There, the ICJ issued four advisory opinions, including one condemning the Security Council's intransigence. Besides Namibia's aggressive legal strategies, there are two fundamental differences between Namibia and Palestine. One, Namibia rejected apartheid South Africa's peace process established as an alternative to an international process and refused to enter into its exclusive sphere of influence, thus maintaining an adversarial position. And two, Namibia's liberation organization, the SWAPO, waged an armed struggle from 1966 until its independence in 1990. In fact, when South Africa finally relinquished control of the territory, Cuba had thousands of troops stationed in Angola prepared to support the SWAPO in its struggle. While Namibia's legal strategy was certainly more strategic, it was not determinative. The reason <coughs> It, Namibia's legal strategy has yielded independence is because it was used in the service of a broader political strategy. This is not to suggest that Palestinians are doomed to fail without an armed struggle for many reasons that's impossible and even counterproductive. But Palestinians cannot prevail without applying coercive pressure as part of a broader political strategy. Such pressure includes economic coercion as an incentive or a disincentive. Other forms of coercion are not material at all, but are normative claims that target the legitimacy of Israel in what Professor Richard Falk has described a legitimacy war and can be marshaled through mass demonstrations, civil disobedience, literature, film, music, knowledge production, media work, and as well as legal challenges. The fact that the Palestinian Authority, despite no longer being uh, willing to come negotiate with the US, which is a critical, necessary, and insufficient step, has not also endorsed the Palestinian boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is in illuminating in this regard. Um, the law is a structure of an oppressive status quo that should provide a strategic compass compass when in the course of that political endeavor an opportunity arises to use the law to further those political goals, it should be used as a matter of principled legal opportunism. Israel has appreciated this logic much better than the Palestinians. That together with its economic, politi political, and military prowess has made international law on balance more beneficial to Israel's interests than it has been to Palestinian ones. Though stateless, and lacking a standing army and modern weapons technologies, Palestinians have in intermittently used the law in the service of their cause, ensuring that international law serves an emancipatory functions, requires that it be used in the service of a robust, unapologetic political movement that can both give meaning to the law as well as directly challenge the structure of power that sustains an oppressive status quo, and in the Palestinian case, has marked them for juridical exclusion in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Nuro. Uh, Mehran? Thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, start by thanking the Arab mm -hmm. Center for uh, 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 inviting me and also for putting this panel together. I have also learned a great deal. Um, uh, Nura concentrated on the Palestinian problem. My brief has been to uh, look at some of the broader international issues that cause insecurity in the Arab world. Uh, not necessarily from a domestic perspective, but from an IR, international relations perspective. Um, and I'm glad we had the uh, very detailed and thorough uh, discussion of the legal aspects of the Palestinian issue, because it goes without saying that uh, the occupation of Palestine has been one of the primary causes of insecurity. So I want to highlight four uh, broad causes of the insecurity of the Arab world from an international perspective, uh, each of which is interrelated and each of which is, deserves um, detailed discussion uh, in its own right. Let me start with the broadest one, which is the architecture of international hierarchy that has emerged particularly since 2011 in the Middle East. This is an architecture uh, at the tip of which we see four regional countries. Uh, two of them are supporters of a status quo, which is American supporter, uh, American supported. And these two are Israel and Saudi Arabia. And on the other side, uh, we see Iran and Turkey, neither of which want to um, support an American engineered status quo and would like to 
exert a level of foreign policy independence. Sometimes this foreign policy uh, of the two countries align, oftentimes they don't align, but nevertheless what they agree in or what places them in the same category at the broadest level is that they do not necessarily see the region through American lenses and would rather have a regional order that uh, is uh, more reflective of their own interests first and foremost and not necessarily the United States interests. At the second level of the regional hierarchy, right before these four countries, uh, we see a bunch of countries that might be considered from a regional perspective at least me, uh, middle powers. And these middle powers are also uh, divided amongst themselves. Some of them support an American engineered regional hierarchy and some of them either don't or are neutral uh, about it. For example, Bahrain, Egypt, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates support an American engineered regional hierarchy. We can think of them as regional middle powers and they align themselves either officially or unofficially, formally or informally with Saudi Arabia and Israel. Whereas on the other side, we see actors such as Algeria, Morocco, Oman, Qatar, uh, Tunisia that are not necessarily um, supportive of Saudi Arabia and Israel's vision of uh, the region uh, and, uh, and how the region ought to be. And probably, and this is something I'll come back to uh, in a minute, probably uh, the biggest source of instability uh, in, in the regional hierarchy are the third and or last group of countries in terms of power and power relationships. And these are either fragile or weak states which cannot necessarily advocate their own interests in the regional arena, never mind the global arena. And of course, Yemen, uh, Libya, Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria fall in this category. So we have this pyramid of power with Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Israel at the very top, a bunch of regional middle powers uh, in the middle, and then, of course, these weak or collapsing states uh, at the bottom, and the regional competition for influence and hegemony, either trying to engineer the region and its hierarchy uh, by each of the four at the top in their own image and in their own interests, or trying to buck the trend. And, and of course, therefore, this hierarchy that we see having emerged since 2011 has been a deep source of instability. Transposed on this is a second factor, a second reason for the chronic insecurity of the Middle East, and particularly the Arab world, but the broader Middle East, and that is the pervasiveness, particularly again since 2011, of identity politics. And identity politics that has seen the Gulf region become the epicenter of sectarianism. We all know that in 2011, February and March of that year, we had a national uprising in Bahrain, which the monarchy very quickly framed in sectarian terms. And this sectarianization of a national uprising was in turn picked up by Saudi Arabia, and from there it spread like wildfire. Uh, it would be unfair, of course, uh, or simplistic at best, to blame sectarianism entirely on governments, on the monarchies of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Of course, it hit a raw nerve, it hit a resonant chord, and you have a pervasiveness of identity entrepreneurs at the social level, in mosques, at, uh, on the media, on the blogosphere, that in turn picked up this narrative of sectarian identity and, uh, and uh, spread it across the region. So uh, there's two points I want to mention uh, before we talk about something other than sectarianism. First is that what we are seeing beginning in 2011 is in many ways a re-sectarianization of the Middle East. It's not the first time that we've had sectarianism be so pervasive at this level. In the 1940s, the colonial powers, particularly the Brits in relation to Palestine and the French in relation to Syria, used sectarianism in order to divide and conquer the lands 
uh, that they wanted to govern. And then, of course, in the 50s, we had secular nationalism. And in the 70s, we had political Islam. And now what we see is the logical extension of that trend of the politicization of Islam, which has been much more primordial core identity of sectarianism. That's one. The other is that there is no party that's innocent. Iran is not innocent in sectarianism, uh, and neither is Saudi Arabia or Bahrain, or for that matter, Qatar, or any of the other regional actors. They're all guilty in terms of a sectarian narrative that supports their regional ambitions and, of course, their political projects domestically. A third factor is the pervasiveness of belligerent actors. What we see is a series of actors in today's Arab world and in the broader Middle East that don't necessarily play with it, uh, within the traditional confines of the uh, of rule of rules of diplomacy. We see uh, pervasiveness, not necessarily an appearance out of nowhere, but a spread of belligerent actors. People like Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Zayed of United Arab Emirates. And what we are seeing is a breakdown of traditional diplomatic norms in, in the Middle East, which has resulted in a pervasiveness of uh, military actions, resort to military boycotts, blockades, things that some years ago were rare occurrences, if not necessarily unheard of. The Arab order, uh, whatever of it there was once, has completely broken down. The GCC has broken down. And part of the fact that all of these traditional diplomatic mechanisms have broken down is because what we see are these actors that are playing by their own rules. They don't necessarily play by established diplomatic norms or diplomatic rules. They see the world uh, uh, and they see opportunities because of the particular evolution of the regional hierarchy, and that's what, they, uh, uh, that's what drives them. That's what animates and motivates them. And of course, what animates and motivates them is a fourth cause for the chronic insecurity of the region. And that is what international relations scholars call the security dilemma. Security dilemma is uh, simply uh, the phenomenon in which when you increase your own security and enhance your own security, you are therefore increasing the insecurity of somebody else. So you get the latest weapon system that makes the weapon system of your opponent obsolete. And so they have to buy the latest weapon system or they have to manufacture the latest uh, ballistic missile. And therefore, there ensues a vicious cycle in which all of these belligerents, all of these regional actors, uh, find themselves, and they constantly have to uh, engage in uh, enhancing their own security producing programs, which in turn uh, deepen the insecurity of others. Now remember that we're talking about a relatively small area. The Middle East is not that big. We're not talking about massive geographies, and we're talking about belligerents that play by their own rules, and we're talking about a pervasiveness of political systems in which central authority has broken down, and therefore there is the opportunity to engage in um, multiple, multiple threat-producing initiatives. There, there is this pervasiveness of, of threats. And how do you get out of security dilemma? You talk to each other, you build trust, you engage in dialogue. And we see that mechanisms for dialogue, the Gulf Cooperation Council or the Arab League, are on life support and they don't necessarily mean anything. So, looking ahead, I know the title of this uh, uh, conference is Beyond Conflict. I wish uh, any of us, I wish I could tell you what some of the solutions are. But let me tell you what I think some of the bigger question marks are that we ought to pay attention to in the coming years. There are five of these question marks that I think uh, are very important for us to pay attention to. 
First of all, and something that has been mentioned here, is the evolution of what might be called the Trump Doctrine. Believe it or not, there is already the beginnings of something resembling a Trump Doctrine, which is in many ways a rehash of the old Nixon Doctrine. You might remember the Nixon Doctrine in relation to the Middle East having uh, two pillars. It was called the Twin Pillars Doctrine of the Nixon administration that saw Iran and Saudi Arabia as the two pillars of American engineered stability in the Middle East. And the Trump Doctrine has also two, two pillars, uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel. Now, interestingly, if you look at the Obama Doctrine, Obama Doctrine called on Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia to learn to share the region together. And American presidents become particularly courageous in the second half of their second term if they get reelected. If they're courageous in their first half, uh, they get, they're one-termers usually, like Jimmy Carter or, the, uh, or George Bush 41. But uh, in the second half, for example, Clinton in his sixth year wanted to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and Obama only after seven years in office had the courage to tell the Saudis that they need to share the region with Iran. But Trump doesn't play by traditional rules of the game, and he might still surprise us. He might change the direction of this Trump doctrine. But, but I think if there is a Trump doctrine, so far it does not necessarily bode well for regional stability and security. A second question uh, to look for is the direction of Saudi politics uh, in, uh, uh, in general and what happens to the Gulf Cooperation Council in particular. Um, so far, it appears as if Mohammed bin Salman's social reforms domestically have been relatively successful, by and large. Will he be able to pull um, Saudi Arabia out of the morass uh, uh, and uh, the quagmire that is Yemen? And what will happen to the Gulf Cooperation Council? Uh, a GCC that currently is on life support. Nobody wants to see the death of the GCC. We all know that there are two main dimensions to the GCC. There's a political dimension in terms of common security agreement, common uh, missile system, and then there's a technical dimension uh, to the uh, GCC. My hunch is that these technical dimensions of the GCC will continue uh, uh, to exist, at least on paper, in terms of um, uh, maybe unifying labor reforms or labor laws, maybe unifying um, laws of movement. Already we see that the VAT system, uh, in these technical terms, uh, the VAT system has also, uh, Qatar will also implement it. But politically, uh, my sense is that the GCC moving forward will be even more meaningless than it has been since its creation as a source of political unity. The third question mark is what happens to Iranian politics. Iran is on the cusp of political change. Khamenei is 80. Despite rumors of ill health, he's been uh, uh, quite uh, uh, healthy, apparently, at least uh, for the last 15 years. But the guy is 80. And I think the question to ask is when Khamenei goes, Will the consensus politics that Rouhani has been able to engineer since his election between the fractious majlis parliament and the, uh, uh, the IRGC, will that, uh, will that continue or will that break apart? And more specifically, what will the IRGC do, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps? Will they make a political grab for power or will they remain uh, uh, in the, uh, behind the scenes? I think it's also important to see what happens to the weak states that predominate the region. Will Iraqi uh, politicians be able to, con uh, to uh, create some sort of uh, meaningful consensus amongst themselves and establish rule? What will happen in Libya? What will happen in Yemen, in Syria, in places where political rule, central authority does not necessarily exist. And I think the last 
question that is more vexing longer term, but nevertheless something that needs to be asked is what will happen to the future of energy. Uh, let's face it, our region is important not because it produces broccoli or cauliflower. Uh, it's important because it produces oil. And as the West and as major oil consumers look elsewhere, look at alternative energy sources, as fracking becomes uh, technologically more feasible, what will happen to the future uh, of our region? For the time being, um, of course, unfortunately, our region will remain unstable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, there you have it. Uh, we have a very, very complicated situation, which we uh, will try to resolve within the next 15 minutes in a Q and an a Q uh, session. Um, uh, I have a uh, quite an, an interesting and uh, very, very uh, large set of questions, uh, that and and yet more, um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll try to get as much of it as uh, possible. Uh, I uh, I try to. Basically, some of them are addressed to specific people, others are addressed to uh, everybody. Um, uh, but uh, for instance, this is uh, from, um, uh, from uh, 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 Brett Boren. Um, uh, what role, and this is for Sarah, what role do you think that the vulnerability of religious and ethnic minorities plays into conflict in the Arab world? Um, well, I mean, the vulnerability of religious and ethnic minorities um, is part and parcel of the vulnerability of many communities, including political oppositions, uh, women, um, uh, uh, and so forth. I mean, certainly it breeds divisions in societies. In a country like Egypt, uh, it often breeds violence, um, really the bulk of the civil society violence we've seen uh, has been interreligious, uh, sadly targeting uh, the Coptic community. Um, but it also is, you know, uh, uh, nothing, nothing unique or, or special about it, uh, oftentimes a deliberate strategy of dividing society and keeping them divided um, uh, as, as a political strategy. Um, so it, it uh, um, uh, I think fits into the overall strategy of keeping civil society divided and marginalized. Um, uh, this is for uh, for uh, Professor um, uh, for Khouri and uh, Sarah from Lamia Al Far. Uh, poverty, lack of education, and uh, deficient civil society are endemic in Arab region. What plague uh, should uh, which which plague? Uh, should it, uh, be addressed first? We're talking about poverty or lack of education. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't think there needs to be a first or a second, um, and unfortunately, we don't have to make that choice. Um, you can invest in education um, for you know all of the essential reasons that any government uh, or society invests in education. And you can uh, invest in civil society or mainly just leave it alone um, so that you can have a vibrant country. You know, countries that stifle and crush their civil societies have no vibrancy. They, um, you know, are, are lethargic and, um, uh, you know, uh, not very interesting and exciting places to be. Um, my uh, analysis has tried to look at the underlying drivers of. Uh, uh, the condition of the Arab world on this, and I'm trying to identify individual dysfunctions. I, I started with a list of around 60. I've brought it down to around 25 and consolidated it. And I've, I've often looked at this issue. People have discussed it and asked me, well, what, what should we do? What's the first thing that we should do? I think if there's one thing that is, if we can only do one thing in the Arab world, it's to provide freedom of expression. Unless individual citizens and groups of citizens are able to speak their mind freely, to check authority, to hold power accountable, to express their grievances, and also to provide solutions and to be involved in constructive mechanisms of development, if we don't have that fundamental underlying freedom to use our uh, voice and our mind, 
uh, then almost nothing else will, will get done. So that, for me, would be the number one. Of the issues that were mentioned, I say there's no doubt that education <coughs> has to be the, um, the critical, uh, f most important reform step that has to be taken, because as I mentioned, education links to uh, employment, links to poverty, links to vulnerability, links to so many other things. And you've got to have a better education outcome, and uh, this education system we have is, is in free fall in most of the region. Uh, and therefore, education absolutely uh, has to get priority. But if there's one lesson from my research, it's that there are so many linkages among all these issues that we need really a wholesale uh, transformation. And this is not easy to do, and it's certainly not going to be done by the existing power structures, and it's certainly not going to be done by the existing external actors, whether they're in the region or uh, international. And therefore, I go back to the, uh, to the ordinary citizens. We have 400 million Arabs. Uh, they have to be the people who drive change, and there's no uh, sign of how they're going to do it, but I think there's no doubt that they will do it uh, eventually, because unlike, um, we're not unlike anybody else in the region. Uh, Long-term subjugation and dehumanization will not persist. It's a, it's a biological reality, not an ideological or a political one, and there will be mechanisms to, uh, to, to solve these issues somehow, but they haven't been identified yet. I think uh, just very quickly, actually, Rami uh, said it. I agree with what Sarah and Rami both said. But let's remember that uh, terrorists usually are highly educated. Uh, people in ISIS, if you look at their profile, these are not uneducated people. And, and therefore, what is important uh, is the larger political system uh, within which people are allowed to express themselves and don't have to resort to uh, such extraordinary means. So by itself, education, enhancing education doesn't necessarily resolve issues unless you give people uh, institutional means of expressing themselves and, of course, uh, work opportunities. Okay. Um, this question is for Noura um, from Dina Hanania from Georgetown University. Do you think that the UN will be an effective front for a principled legal Palestinian political movement? So I guess this goes uh, back to the heart of, of what I was expressing. Whether What the UN does, the UN is, is, is basically a composite of 194 states. It is a state-centric legal order that tries to balance political interests and is not above them. There is no, in our international system, there is no global enforcement mechanism that exists outside of this Westphalian state-centric world order, which is why you cannot extricate these international legal principles from the politics uh, and national <coughs> interests of these states. Now, the UN has historically been effective on a number of fronts. When it has been effective, uh, and I think the times that it was most effective, especially on the question of Palestine, was during a third world upheaval when uh, newly independent and national liberation movements seeking the end of colonization consolidated their power in order to establish a front to a Western international order. In that moment, we saw the UN create a right to self-determination for colonized people and to specifically make legal the use of revolutionary violence for those ends. That was a product of, of the UN, but it was mostly a product of an international system at that time and a third world revolt, which threatened to unravel Western hegemony. Since then, we've seen the decline of that order. The end of it, I would say, was in the early 1990s, the independence of Namibia, the end of apartheid in South Africa, the dissolution of the Cold War, um, and, and the defeat of the Soviet Union. And we saw the Palestinian question resolved during this time when it was ensconed within a peacemaking framework, which we just unceremoniously celebrated last week, 25 years of this framework, uh, which was basically a, a situation of, of even making the occupation even more permanent. And so we are now in a completely different order, one that it, where the third world revolt has been enfolded, where these once revolutionary regimes that you know, consolidated people's interests became authoritarian rulers who squashed social movements, who've been enfolded in a neoliberal um, regime that have become indebted uh, mostly to the West and have lack 
I think, complete imagination about what our future can look like. Our current existence today was not an inevitability. We constructed this present. There is a history of this present. And we have the wherewithal and the capacity to construct a new future, including a future of the law, including a future of the UN, including a structure where there aren't these permanent powers in the Security Council who can define uh, what, what, what that order looks like. And so I guess my answer to this question, what do I expect from the UN? It all depends. It all depends on what people uh, do mostly and on what the, what the representatives of those people do with, within that system. Uh, I apologize for violating the, uh, the, this last name, Vincent Loteso, I think, uh, unaffiliated. Uh, this is for uh, uh, Mehran or Rami. Uh, can you address the role of nationalism in the Arab world before or after 2011 uprisings? Well, as Mehran said, we've had uh, episodes of sectarianism that uh, included in the 50s and 60s Arab nationalism. Um, I think what we, uh, we've seen the collapse of the Arab nation concept, we've seen the collapse of the uh, integrated Arab region concept, and we're seeing in many, not all states, the collapse of the integrated state, um, because the relationship, the fundamental relationship between citizen and state was never effectively uh, fulfilled because the citizens of the Arab world were never given an opportunity to define that relationship. We've never had, other than the ongoing attempt in Tunisia, we've never had a self-determinant Arab citizenry. So Tunisia is the first example of citizens who debated and wrote their own constitution and are trying to implement it. And we hope it, it succeeds, we'll see. Uh, but the, the idea of nationalism I think is one that is still very vague in the Arab world. There certainly is, the question of Arab identity is very real. Uh, and you see this uh, all over the Arab region. People who speak Arabic, who most of them are Muslims, not all of them, but uh, they, there is a c common sort of Arab identity that's very cultural and historical and very emotional in many ways. Uh, but there is no more con concept of really Arab nationalism uh, as such. And the the pressures that have created rebellions and the various reactions that I mentioned that created a disintegration of uh, integrated Arab citizenry and region and state, um, those rebellions by what individual desperate citizens are just trying to find their own way to keep their family alive in about two thirds of the uh, populations uh, uh, of the Arab world. We have 400 million Arabs of whom around 300 million are not sure where they're gonna feed their kids next month. Uh, unless people come to grips with this fundamental reality um, there, that uh, the future of the region is gonna be very, uh, very difficult and, and, and nationalism is certainly low on the list of, uh, of issues. Um, uh, Rami and I are very good friends and uh, I've, uh, over the years I've learned a great deal from Rami but let me just uh, uh, take a slightly different perspective than Rami. Beginning in the 1950s we see the rise of state-centered nationalism across the Middle East and particularly in the Arab world. And this is a state-centered nationalism in which the person of the leader uh, tried to convince uh, his people that uh, the uh, defense of the nation also meant the glorification of the leader and used nationalism as a, one of the main pillars of a ruling bargain in which in return for um, national defense, uh, the state demanded political compliance. And, and we see this, versions of this uh, throughout. Uh, the one interesting development that has happened is in my neck of the woods. I live in Qatar. Uh, and what we see is that for a variety of reasons, Qatar didn't, or rather the Gulf states, did not undergo this same process. Uh, because of their size, because of their political history, because of uh, various dynamics, their relationship with Britain. And what happened is that beginning in the 1970s, but particularly in the 1980s, 1990s, and the 2000s, each of these new states, newly independent states, 
established very robust heritage industries. And all of a sudden, by the time 2010, 2011 comes along, we see that they are now experiencing what the rest of the Arab world experienced in the 1960s and the 1970s, which is raw nationalism, this kind of uh, like a kid in a schoolyard, a 15-year-old boy in a schoolyard, insecure and, and trying to um, beat up others in order to get, uh, get his uh, say. And this is exactly what we're seeing in the Gulf region, the invasion, uh, the, the attempt to finally subjugate uh, Yemen on the part of Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, UAE's attempt to, um, uh, to reshape uh, the, uh, the Red Sea. Uh, in, its, uh, in its own interests, uh, towards its own interests. Qatar's presumption that it could shape the future of Libya after, uh, after Gaddafi was overthrown. And so what we see in, in the Gulf region is this new kind of raw nationalism, in many ways uh, state-centered again, uh, this time not necessarily by presidents for life, but by ruling families that for the last 20, 30 years, have shaped national narrative and national identity in their own service and their own interests, and now the chickens have come home to roost. Thank you. Um, there are so many good questions. We only have about four or five minutes left. Um, uh, this is for Dora. Um, how do we approach this legal implementation of occupation? What role or approach should be taken in regards to human rights violations? Um, that's a great question, and I think something that we've been grappling with. So just, to, I guess, to summarize, the, the root of this question goes to if, as I've suggested, if what I've suggested is in fact true, that occupation law and international humanitarian law as a framework has actually worked to, um, uh, to disadvantage Palestinians, rather than advance their cause for sovereignty, then what is it that we do with this body of law? This creates a bit of a contradiction. This is not easy to just say, okay, well, we don't want IHL anymore. We'll no longer call it occupied. The whole framework of occupation has created a right for Palestinians to be able to demand sovereignty, to demand the state, which we see them do in their Declaration of Independence in 1988. So it actually creates this right and creates a shift in Palestinian thinking that begins act much earlier than 1988 and begins as early as 1968, according to the memoirs of Salah Khalaf or Abu Iyad in Fatah, um, and as early as 1974, which we're seeing in the direct aftermath of the October 1973 war. So there is something to be said for that framework. But if we understand and take seriously Israel's refusal to recognize Palestinians as a people and to recognize their sovereignty. If we take seriously that the partition within Palestine is not a viable one and one that will on its own continue to produce of logic of separation, forced population transfer, militarization, surveillance, walls, this is the logic that partition in Palestine produces. It's a logic that we've rejected in Yugoslavia, in uh, other parts of the world, and yet here we want to celebrate it. We rejected it in South Africa. Here is the one place where we want to celebrate it and uphold it as a viable solution. So when we come to terms with that, here we can see that despite the international consensus on IHL, that we are in a current state and a reality where IHL and occupation law is actually helping to subvert the existing reality of a de jure apartheid regime, one that, despite all of the international community's denial, Israel said, hey, you don't believe we're apartheid? We're going to pass a national state law in July 2018. Israel is for Jews only, and not for Jewish citizens, for Jewish people, which means that the citizens, the Muslim and Christian citizens, are by law uh, second class and, and have less claims than a global jury. And, and makes it, makes settlement in Israel, within Israel and the, and the West Bank a matter of constitutional priority. 
we can no longer deny now that there is no partition as a viable solution. And at this point, IHL is only making the very obvious and the very clear is delaying that process of us confronting that reality and, and of calling Israel an apartheid state, which does not require a Palestinian state in order to resolve this issue, but actually requires a dismantlement of a discriminatory regime based on racial logics and legal and spatial separation. Um, if uh, I could, you. if I could just add, yeah, please, uh, yeah. if I could just add to that, I mean, the application of what is supposed to be temporary occupation law, which by its terms, as Nuda has described, suspends civil and political, economic, social, and cultural rights on an emergency law, military law exception basis, in a permanent situation, which is the situation we have now in Palestine, um, fundamentally subverts the intention of what's supposed to be temporary restrictions. The dilemma we're in is that we don't have a framework uh, to use for situations of permanent occupation. That's a gap in international humanitarian law. Uh, what we can only do is fall back uh, on the natural law uh, that is supposed to apply, and that's the law uh, of human rights, of civil and political rights. And ultimately, I think, what Palestinians are increasingly recognizing, what many Israelis are increasingly recognizing, um, is that the focus, the singular and exclusive focus on ending the occupation and establishing a two-state solution, um, which we must now put to rest as a dead cause, um, is to focus on the basic human rights of all of the, op uh, of all of the peoples under Israeli sovereignty, civil and political rights, uh, human rights that every other human being we say is entitled to. It can't be that we are going to suspend the rights of Palestinians as human beings in perpetuity until such time as the crisis is resolved. That's a very effective strategy, never to give them rights. Just the contrary. We have to grant uh, Palestinians, like any other peoples, their full civil and political, economic, social, and cultural rights, and then there can be some kind of a political negotiation that may lead to two states or three states or ten states, whatever, who cares? Um, but first you have to give the rights to the people. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I apologize for not uh, getting to a whole lot of the other good questions, but uh, time has, was limited. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this really very, very good panel. Thanks for the panelists. Uh, now, please um, uh, join us for uh, Lunch Next Door, uh, uh, featuring the keynote uh, conversation with Ambassador Thomas Pickering, uh, Pickering titled The Rebuilding of the Middle East, U.S. Policy in a Contentious Region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.